Hey, I'd like to welcome everyone to worship. Let's all stand together. If you'd like to get a hymnal, let's turn to page 28. We sing an old hymn song. I'm so glad I heard my Savior gently pleading. Now I'm an heir and child of God, I truly know. All the way home is precious and is daily leading. It's a grand
Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fire. sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the what you say though the storms may come and the winds may roll I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great Your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may roll, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to ground 
my hope and firm foundation you'll never let me down i put my faith in jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation he'll never let me down i put my faith in jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation he'll never let me down i put my faith in jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation he'll never now 
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is amen as Jesus was entering Jerusalem for the last time, people were crying out and singing and crying, Hosanna, the king has come. And the Pharisees and the officials from the town said, tell your disciples to quieten down and not make so much noise. And Jesus says, if they don't cry out in my name, the rocks will cry out. Man, that's a powerful name, man. And you know, we say things like that. We sing things like that, oh, it's a powerful name. But guys, the name of Jesus is powerful. And it wasn't just powerful for the Jewish people that needed redemption when Jesus came to this earth. It's not just powerful for your neighbor that's got something going on in his life. It's not just powerful for the person who's sick and, and battling cancer. The name of Jesus is powerful for all of us because we're all going through something. And we've all got something that's in front of us that looks like it's impossible. But man, nothing's impossible in the name of Jesus. It is a powerful, powerful name. And man, we ought to be thankful for it. Man, God has given us a day today. We woke up today. We see the sunshine. We know God is good. We got reason to give him praise. Take your Bibles this morning. Uh, we're going to start off in the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We heard fantastic messages this week from the Word of God, and I know that um, I know that Brother Joel Franks was preaching exactly what God had put on his heart and teaching the morning classes. And man, it seemed like the kids were just soaking it up. Man, they were just taking it all in. But I'm not so sure that we adults that were there didn't get more from it than the kids. Uh, it was it was absolutely phenomenal, and um, God just really was was moving this week, and so thankful for it. And um, I want to take you this morning, though, to uh, we're going to talk about the fruits of the spiritual war. When God put spiritual warfare on my heart, I said, "God, I just preached on spiritual warfare." And then I went back and started looking at my notes, and I didn't just preach on spiritual warfare. <laughs> it seems like I did. Uh, but that's what happens when you ramble when you preach. I might have preached on a lot of things in the last few weeks. I don't remember. Uh, maybe you do. But you know, they say you got to hear something four or five times before you actually submit it to your mind. So maybe this is one of those times. So uh, we're going to uh, we're going to start out in the book of Matthew chapter seven, as Jesus is teaching his disciples. He says, "Beware of false prophets." This is verse fifteen, Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Verse 16, you will, what's the word here? You will know in the King James, or you will recognize them. You will see it, you will know. You will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus says, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. I'll take you back to verse 15. Jesus said, beware of false prophets. When you look up what that term means in the, in the Greek language that, that Jesus would have been speaking there, it means a religious imposter, someone who looks good on the outside, someone who seems supportive, someone who seems on board with the things of God outwardly, but on the inside they are seeking their own way. They are seeking to betray. They are seeking to devour. Verse 16 says, we can't depend on how things look. You will recognize them, not just how they look, but what happens 
in their life. You see, many can put on a pretty face. Anyone can get dressed up and cleaned up for church. Anyone can walk around carrying a Bible. This is not what Jesus says we will know the prophet by or the false prophet or the false teacher. Jesus says we will know them by their fruit, which means their actions. The results of what we do are our fruit, what comes from our life. It's the evidence of who we are on the inside. We will be known by the evidence that comes from our lives. Grapes are not gathered from thorns. It's the principle of the harvest. I've mentioned it to you over and over again. The principle of the harvest reaffirms the integrity of God. If you take an apple tree and you plant it, it will not grow oranges. It will not produce figs. That's what he's saying. The thorn bush will not produce figs. It will not produce uh, grapes. It's the principle of the harvest. What you put into the ground, what you sow, is what you will reap from. It's the principle that God has given us to live by. It's the principle of nature. So what was Jesus teaching? Jesus is saying that good fruit won't come from bad trees. That we can know someone's heart by what we see come from their lives. That was the lesson that Jesus was getting across. And I believe we understand this principle. So what about the fruit? What about the fruit? Where's the fruit? How do we identify the fruit? What's the fruit that, that our lives as believers in Christ, what fruit should we be producing? Paul gives us a, a great, great illustration and list of this in the book of Galatians chapter 5. If you'll look there, that's where we'll be the rest of this time together. Galatians 5. Paul is talking about living a Christian life and how when you are living a Christian life and you are in the battle that it takes to live the Christian life, that there will be evidence from where we are in the battle that comes from our life. Paul refers to this as the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 Paul says, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So he gives the works of the flesh first, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I had in my mind today, That what we would call this today, what our lesson would be more on today, would be the unsaved Christian. Churches full of people who will profess to know who Jesus is. Claim Christianity. Baptized in water. Members on the church roll. But no evidence of a relationship with Jesus Christ unsaved, unbelieving because believing leads to faith. But God took us another way. And I always trust where God takes us because his way is always better. Guys, if these evils that were just listed in verses 19 to 21, if these are the fruits that our lives bear, then we are not saved. I'm not talking about a mistake I'm not talking about, hey, I got caught up in something. Hey, something in my life led me astray. I'm talking about if this is how we live, if this is where we are comfortable, if this is what our life produces, and we're okay with that, we do not know the love of Christ. We do not know the forgiveness of Christ. We do not know the grace of God. We are unsaved because the principle of the harvest says the bad tree will not produce good fruit, and the good tree will not produce 
poor fruit. The reason my mind was even on the fruit of the Spirit is I was thinking about how we make excuse about patience. I was being convicted in my own life. I was thinking about how impatient I am so often. And I make excuse. And I say, well, the Lord's teaching me patience. I'm I'm growing in my patience. That's not what Paul describes. Paul says patience is an evidence of the Spirit. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, which means that if I don't have patience, I am not allowing the Spirit to be evident in my life. If I do not love, if I am not kind, if I am not forgiving, evidence of my walk with Christ is not showing in my life. We make excuse. And if we understand the principle of the harvest and how the fruit of the spiritual things in our life actually works, we see things differently. If the fruit of the Spirit that we're about to describe right here that Paul gives us is not evident in our lives then the Spirit is not there. And if the Spirit is not there, we are not saved. Friends, I'm telling you, I did not come here today to convince you that you are not saved. That is not my goal. It's not what I'm looking to do. However, God has placed it upon my heart to look into my own life and to challenge you to look into your own life. And check your fruit. What are we bearing? What is the evidence of what God is doing on the inside? Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. It's goodness. It's faithfulness. It's gentleness. It is self-control. Yes, that is in the Bible. Some of us act like that was an Old Testament principle that passed away with not eating pork. Hey, it's still in there. Still in there. Self-control, New Testament. Against such things there is no law. And you know, I thought about how often we make excuses for our children. I've done it. Been there. How we make excuses for our children when we don't see evidence, when we don't see fruit from their lives. And we make excuses and we we say things like, well, kids will be kids. By the way, the Bible says that's true, but the rod of correction will drive it from them. Uh, But that's free. I just throw that in there. Just, you know, parenting tip, free. Um, Well, they're just sowing their wild oats. Find that in the Bible. It's not there. just hormones pretty sure God created those two if he created those he created us to kind of be in control of them there it's not what the scripture says Galatians 5 16 says this but I say walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh we got to stop making excuses because the Bible doesn't make excuses for it the Bible says to flee immorality Flee from it. Run from it. Do not allow ourselves to be caught in the situation of it. The evidence of the Spirit in our life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So why are we okay with the fruit being absent as we raise up our young people? Y'all ready for this? Put on your seatbelts. Because we're okay with it being absent in our life. We're holding, we're holding our kids to the standard that we don't hold ourselves to. Where's our fruit? What are we living out? Where's our evidence? Where is it? Let the word of God be a mirror this morning. God's already whipped me left and right this morning. What do you see more of in your life? What's produced in your action, 
in your conversation? Do we see immorality? Do we see jealousy? Do we see fits of anger and envy? Do we see constant division? Why do we tear each other down? Listen to me. If you profess to be a Christian, why would you ever tear another Christian down? Why do we speak ill of one another? Jesus spoke on it very clearly. He told the Jews, he said, stop trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a whole stick of firewood in your own. He said, rather, get your own eyes clear, and then you'll be able to see everything. Brothers and sisters, why are we so divisive? Why? I don't want to get on a tangent this morning, but everybody knows what went on this week, right? The federal Supreme Court overturned an, 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 an old law, Roe versus Wade, which should in essence, end abortion. Now, all I have saw since that time is Christian people bickering and arguing and defending and being offended. Why? Why? We ought to be for life. We ought to be for life. But listen to me. We ought to be for life. We ought to be for life for the unborn because they don't have a voice. But we ought to also be for life for people who don't know what to do, for people who are confused, for people who are hurt. People, I'm telling you, the church for too long has carried around the spirit of condemnation to the point to where when people find themselves in trouble, the church is the last place they want to go because they know they're going to be talked about. They know they're going to be put down. And they'd rather go into life than to face the shame that they're going to face. Among God's people, heaven forbid, we should be ashamed. There should never be someone in the family of God who is too afraid to admit when there's been wrong because the condemnation is going to be too severe. Jesus took on the condemnation on the cross. Jesus provided forgiveness. And we sit around with our self-righteous attitude. God died for the lost. He died for those babies. He died for all. Why can't we put away a spirit of condemnation and say, how would Jesus love? How would Jesus love? What if we got to do as the church to help people to want life? To want life. Listen, get your facts straight. Get your facts straight. If there's someone whose life is in danger, there's always been procedures to save the mother's life. Always. Always. Without question. If someone is caught up in an atrocious act, rape or incest, there's always been a way. Okay? We better be about life. We better be about life. The unborn and the living. We better be about life. Because God created life. Me and my sister were talking last night. My sister said, if abortion had have been easy in 1969, I wouldn't be here today. My mother made the hard choice. She bore the shame because she believed in life. And she knew that that baby was meant to be here. It's been one of the greatest blessings of my life. I love my sister. And I love my parents for enduring the hardship that they faced. And all the talk and all the embarrassment to raise up a godly young lady. How dare we as the church not try to help those who are hurting? How dare we as God's people always have a spirit of division and condemnation we got to get our hearts right we got to get our spirit right we got to get our walk right guys there is a spiritual battle 
that is going on around us every single day. If we are walking in the Spirit, then we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So what what do we got to do? What are we as Christians, what have have we got to do to get in this get in this place to where the evidence of God is in us and comes out of us. The first thing we've got to have, there must be a spiritual walk. Hear what I'm saying to you this morning. There must be a spiritual walk. Our walk is how we live. It's what we do. It's what comes from the decisions that we make. There must be a spiritual walk. Paul says if we walk in the Spirit... We will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. We must lead spiritual lives. God's people, why are we not spiritual people? We hear it every week. We can't walk and be who God wants us to be without being full of the Spirit. So why aren't we spiritual people? You know what it takes to be a spiritual person? we got to be intentional. we got to look for the spiritual things that are going on in our life. You know what spiritual things are going on in your life right now? Everything. Because if God is all up in everything that you're doing, then there is a spiritual lesson to be learned in almost everything that we face in this life. We need to be intentional about the things of God. We need to look for ways to have spiritual conversations. Now look, don't be that weird dude, okay? Y'all know who I'm talking about. Hey, did you catch that game last night? Well, I'll tell you the game you better catch. You better catch hold of Jesus Christ or you're not going to go to heaven. Man, ain't this weather something? Yeah, but I'll tell you what's hotter. It's going to be hell, fire, and brimstone if you don't get right. Don't be that guy, okay? Don't be that guy. People will avoid you if you are that guy. But listen to me very clearly. If you know who you are in Christ and you know what God has done in your life, And you pray and you say, God, let me use what I've been through in my life to be a blessing to somebody. Let what I've gone through, good, bad, or otherwise, be used to glorify you. God will put the people in your situation, and sometimes they will come to you. We've got to be intentional about being spiritual people. Look for spiritual ways. Look for ways to have a spiritual conversation with your children. And we're talking about our our kids showing the fruit of the Spirit. Man, let's give them reminders. This is not a reminder. Well, man, I thought thought you made a profession of faith. Well, Well, then why are you acting like you're acting? That's not a spiritual reminder. Let's remind what God says. Let's show the grace that Jesus shows us. We make sure our conversation is always seasoned with grace. Now, I know for some of y'all that sounds impossible. I'm not telling you you got to be Bob Ross running around painting happy little trees all over everything. That is not what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't know who Bob Ross is. Google him and you'll, you'll know. The dude with the afro that paints. I mean, just you can find him. But if we set our minds on spiritual things, we will have spiritual things in our conversation. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things of this earth. Listen to me. Get your mind out of the gutter. (coughs) Wow. Boy, the devil did not want me to say that. Almost choked to death on it. Get your mind out of the gutter. Stop being a worry wart. Stop being fix it Felix. Give it to God. Kids, tell your parents who fix it Felix is later on, okay? If the Spirit of God is not evident in our life, something's missing. Something's missing. If people can't identify you, with what you profess to believe, there is a disconnect. Guys, there has to be a spiritual walk. 
you can put it on your social media. You can tag Christian Post and do your verse of the day. But if our life doesn't reflect the evidence of what God's doing on the inside, we don't have a spiritual walk. And there must be a spiritual walk in order to show the fruit of the Spirit. There's something else that there must be inside of us. There must be a spiritual war. There must be a spiritual war. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. <coughs> I keep looking for my microphone so I don't cough in it. That's why I look like I'm having a stroke up here when I go to cough. Y'all just give me a minute. Bear with me. Galatians 5 and 17. It says, For the desire of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. There is a battle going on in your heart and in your mind every day if you are saved. What I'm seeing more and more is we have Christian pacifists. We don't want the war. We don't want the battle. We'd rather go along with sin than to do the hard thing and fight the battle and stand up for what is spiritual and what we know to be true. Listen to me. Your flesh, and some of you are thinking, well, I thought I died to that flesh. When I got saved, I put all that away. You are still human. How many of y'all are still human? Okay, some of y'all aren't sure. Okay. I know. Some days it's tough. As long as we're human, there's going to be flesh that tries to kick up. There's going to be flesh that tries to remind us of who we're not, of what we used to do, of what we did like. But the day you got saved, the day you asked Jesus Christ to change your life, you were given the Holy Spirit in your heart. And it's the most powerful thing in this world. Or out of this world. You know, wouldn't it be so much easier if, like, living right just came by physically attacking somebody? You know what I mean? If you could really beat the spirit into people. Brother Mike, wouldn't that be easier? You could just keep your bully club in the back of that big old white truck, and when you walk up at that sawmill, you just go to work. Just start smacking people. Clay would be the first one you're looking for, Right? Just beat them into spiritual submission. But it doesn't work that way. Because we got this whole free will thing going on. And every day it's a battle. Every day it's about what we choose, who we're going to be. It's a battle to control your actions and how you live. And guys, if we're, if we're praying... If we're seeking the things of God, if we're allowing spiritual things into our life that nourish us, well, we're strong in our spirit. Not perfect, but we're strong in our spirit. And that battle against all that flesh and all those things we don't like is so much better. We feel the strength and the power of God in us. And we begin to see that when we rely on Christ, we can win the spiritual battle. However, if we don't make the things of God a priority, if we are not intentional, if we do not seek to have that presence in our life, we don't spend our time in prayer. We don't pick up God's word. We don't try to fight those negative thoughts that seem to always come. Then our flesh just gets stronger and stronger. To the point that sometimes we don't even think about the bad thoughts that we have. We don't even think about the negative things that we say. Because we're just living in our flesh. Guys, that's not who we are to be as the people of God. We must walk in the Spirit and we must battle. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. He says, with my whole heart, I agree with the law of God. 
I believe as people today, would we all agree with the law of God? That God is good, amen? We can all agree with that. Sin is bad, amen? We can all agree with that. We're thankful for grace and forgiveness. We can all agree with that. Paul says, with my whole heart, I agree with the law of God. But the next verse, in verse 23, Romans 7, 23. But in every part of me, I discover something fighting against my mind. And it makes me a prisoner of sin that controls everything I do. That was the Apostle Paul that wrote that, okay? You know, he's a pretty good guy. You know, he actually had a face-to-face meeting with Jesus. He wrote most of the New Testament. He was martyred for the faith that he had. But you know what he said? Man, I believe in the things of God. But there is something in me that's always fighting. It's always pulling me toward those things that I do not need. There are too many people who profess Christianity, but they never give a thought to the spiritual battle, and therefore they live carnal lives with no evidence of the Spirit. There's too many. There's too many of us that do not give thought to the spiritual battle that's going on on the inside. When we're mad, we just get mad. When we're envious, we just want. When we're hurt, we don't forgive. Because we don't walk in the spirit. We allow the carnal to rule our life. Listen to me, because this is important. We have all had times when we are closer to God than other times. If you've been walking in your faith for very long, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are times when you've seen God renew your spirit. There are times when you've seen God work miracles in your family, in your church. Man, you you just felt like you were walking on air. And then there are times when we have to push ourselves to pray. Push ourselves to praise, even though we know the goodness of God. I know what it means to be in a rut. I know that. But listen to me. If you are a Christian, you cannot live in sin and conviction not hurt you daily. If you are living with those fruits of the carnal life in your daily conversation, in your daily action, and you are unrepentant, you better look out. Because something has happened to the spirit within you. You have grown callous to God's conviction and God's call. There's a lot of people that they think about blaspheming the Holy Spirit as saying a word. Guys, the one sin that can't be forgiven, that blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, is a rejection of the conviction of God on your heart. That's the only sin that can't be forgiven. Is when we become stiff-necked and hard-hearted and refuse to repent. And refuse to allow conviction to get us out of the cold, hard state that we are in. Christian people, get in the war. Suit up with the whole armor of God. Get into the word of God. Make your profession of faith and get ready. Because it's coming. Get ready for the battle. Because God has called you to engage in the spiritual war. It's time to allow God to renew the spirit that is placed inside of us. So there must be a spiritual walk. We must be spiritual people in order for there to be spiritual fruit. There must be a spiritual war. We must go to battle for the things of God. But finally, there must be a spiritual win. Look at Galatians 5 and 18. Paul says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Guys, we've got to come to a place to where we're winning the spiritual battle. To where we're depending on God and we're seeing him make a difference in our life. We're seeing him make a difference in our conversation. We're seeing him make a difference in our attitude. We're finding forgiveness. We're coming after peace. Not because we're good or we have it all figured out, but because God is good. And because of what Jesus Christ has done, we can proclaim his promises. And we can win the battle. We can trust in the Lord. We can see God do a mighty work. Now listen to me. The spiritual win is not like a cultural win. Not like a carnal win. In our culture, when you win, you get a trophy. Of course, now, you kind of get one anyway, right? But when I was growing up, the winner got a trophy. Now they get a ring. You get a banner. Well, that's not what the spiritual win looks like. Let me describe to you a little bit about the spiritual win because many times we don't even recognize the spiritual win when it occurs. A spiritual win is when you're in a heated discussion and you want to get in the last word, but you don't. You close your mouth and you let the Spirit of God work and you show some self-control. That's a spiritual win. That's a win that a lot of us will never see because we've always got to get the last word, right? That's a spiritual win. A spiritual win is when you don't get invited to be a part. You're not included. And at first you're bitter. But then you allow the Holy Spirit to show you that you're being shielded from something that God wants you to have no part of. That's a spiritual win. When we give God praise for what he's done. A spiritual win is when something catches your eye but you set your mind on something spiritual. A spiritual win is when something makes you angry, but you pray and you find peace. Guys, those are spiritual wins. This is the life that God intends for his followers to live. But in order to have spiritual wins, we must have a spiritual walk. We've got to be spiritual people. And we've got to battle in the Spirit. When we do these things, our reward is not a trophy. It's not a banner. But it's a crown of life that we've been promised in heaven. And it's worth more than anything that we're ever going to receive on this earth. God has so much more for us in this earth and beyond. So I want us to stop making excuses when the fruit of the Spirit is not evident in our life. Take your offended hat off. Stop being offended if someone calls you out. Let's recognize when the fruit of the Spirit is not coming through in our life. And let's get back to the Word. Let's get back to where our real power is, which is prayer. Let's commit ourselves to getting back to the excitement than it is to live for God. Have we just gotten old? Nothing excites us anymore? Guys, there is an exciting life to be lived for Jesus. There's something new every day when you're walking after God, when you're asking him to to open your eyes up to what he has for you. There's nothing else that you're going to find in this life. It's going to give you the adrenaline rush of knowing that you've done something for God. And he is alive in your spirit. Guys, let's stop making excuses. Let's stop being okay with just being okay. Man, let's get into the war. Let's get into the walk. Let's allow God to do something huge in our life. And let's be people who live out the spirit. And the fruits of the spirit that lives inside of us. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. And I told you this morning. God just, he put this on my spirit even while I was praying this morning. That his word today would be like a mirror for us. 
that when we look into God's word, it reveals to us our, our flaws. It reveals to us the, the places where we aren't where we should be. But you know, the great thing about the word of God is it doesn't leave us there. It's not like keeping the Old Testament law that just brought condemnation. See, when we look in the Word of God, we, we realize we're not going to be perfect. We're just like Paul describes, we're in a battle. And some days we win. And it's great and we celebrate it. But man, some days we're just losing. We don't feel like we can get on top. We don't feel like we can get ahead. We must walk with Christ. For the Christian, that's how we win. That's how we receive victory. Through His grace. Through His mercy. God's Word says, Greater is He that is within me than all the power that's in the world. Guys, we can find strength in Him. We can live out what we believe. got to do it through him so as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning what, what's, what's your evidence what's your fruit what do people see what does the world see what are those who know you best those in your own house what do they see from your spiritual walk are we the good tree that's producing good fruit it's the evidence of what the Spirit of God is doing inside of us. Listen to me. If you're here this morning and when you evaluate your life and you don't see the fruit that you want to see, God's not condemning you this morning. He's convicting you. See, there's a difference. Condemnation is judgment. Condemnation is final. Conviction is a drawing from an almighty loving God that says, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what God's offering this morning. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I want you to pray. God, what does my fruit look like? God, what am I producing? What am I seeing? Help me to stop making excuses, God. Man, I want to live it out. And if you're here today, and all this talk of producing fruit and Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit really doesn't mean anything to you because you've really never given your life over to Christ. You have no idea what it means for the Holy Spirit to be strong within you. And today is the day of your salvation. God has brought you here for this purpose today. To hear the word of God and to know that there is hope for your soul. There is hope for your eternity through Jesus Christ. The Bible says he loves you so much that he gave his own life. So that you could spend eternity with him. So as we go to the Lord in prayer, I want you to get real with God this morning. If you need to come to this altar, the altar's open. Be obedient to what the spirit of God lays on your heart. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. God, thank you for the clarity that we find in your word. Jesus, I am so thankful that you are the master illustrator. God, that you put a word upon us that cannot be mistaken. Father, you teach us on a child's level the simplicity of of putting ourself down, our pride down, our feelings down. And allowing you to come in and be Lord of our life. God, we need you this morning. God, there are so many things going on around us in our world, in our life, in our home, that are so far out of our control that are so much bigger than we even feel like we have the strength for. But God, you've been faithful. 
And when you tell us in your word that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, God, you're always true. You're always right. You're always real. Father, I pray we'd put down our walls this morning. We put down our pride this morning. We put down our burden this morning. We'd fall humble before you. Father, not our will be done, but yours. God, you show us what we've got to do to be drawn close during this time. We believe in you. We trust you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Many have come. Maybe you need to come. You know, when we come before God and we come to the altar, it's not a place of shame. It's a place of redemption. In the Old Testament, the altar was the place where they brought the sacrifice. And what was offered was sent up to God. Give it to God this morning. Find that strength this morning. If you need to come, won't you come?
And with that, all God's people said, you know, Jesus said that in, unless we come to him with the faith of a child, we will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, what I observed this week and even this morning, you know, when a child comes to Christ, they don't have it all figured out. You know, they don't know everything in the Bible. They don't know everything about struggles in life because they haven't experienced all the struggles in life. Man, they know when God's calling them. And I don't know why we as adults feel like we got to have it all figured out. You know, we sit on our problems. We stress ourselves to the point of sickness. And God's saying, come to me. We're his child same way you hurt for your children and you want to see them come and make good decisions and follow you man an almighty all knowing all loving God is looking down at us in that same manner saying why are you stressing come see me I got it come bring it to me that's our God amen and he's good man God is for you don't let the world don't let the devil Don't let your neighbor tell you that God is not for you because God is for you. He is for us and uh, we should be thankful.